All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Arms Control Association briefing on why the Iran nuclear deal is a win for nuclear nonproliferation and international security. Uh, my name is Daryl Kimball. I'm the executive director of the Independent Nonpartisan Arms Control Association, and uh, we welcome you here to the Carnegie Endowment on this uh, Tuesday morning after Labor Day, and we're ready to get to work. Um, this afternoon, the U.S. Congress is going to begin debate on a resolution on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the July 2014 agreement uh, between the United States, other world powers, and Iran that uh, we believe will effectively and verifiably block all of Iran's pathways to nuclear weapons. Uh, this agreement has the support of 75 former members of Congress, a growing number of national security leaders, the vast majority of nuclear nonproliferation experts, retired generals and admirals, top scientific leaders, 100 former ambassadors, the UN Security Council, and by the way, the American public, among others. So the vast majority of those members of Congress who did take the time to review this very complex 159-page document, along with the related UN Security Council resolution and the associated IAEA and Iran work plan, have, for the most part, come out in favor of the agreement. And we at the Arms Control Association are uh, increasingly confident that at the end of the process, there will be enough votes to allow the implementation of this multifaceted, multi-year, multilateral agreement. And one key reason is because it is a major plus for nonproliferation and international security, and because its rejection would turn this major diplomatic success into a geopolitical disaster. So the theme of uh, this morning's address uh, with uh, Colin Call, who is uh, Deputy Assistant to the President and National Security Advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, uh, is going to be about the uh, implications of the deal, uh, the benefits, and uh, what would happen if it were to be rejected. And so this uh, address by Colin, uh, followed by your questions, um, We'll end at about 9.45, uh, at which point we're going to take a, a halftime break as uh, Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid speaks upstairs. Uh, you'll be able to view his address here if you want to grab an extra cup of coffee and watch. And then we will resume at 11 o'clock with um, an expert panel discussion uh, that will go for about an hour. So with that, Colin, we're very pleased to have you here once again. This is the second time you've spoken before an Arms Control Association audience on this topic, and I think uh, it's fair to say your remarks last time were very persuasive because that was just after the deal, and so there's increasing support. So uh, we welcome you back here. Thanks for being with us. morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Daryl. Thanks to the Arms Control Association for continuing to do uh, all that you do every day to educate people about uh, this deal and a uh, host of other important um, arms control issues. You know, um, at the when you get on an airline, uh, sometimes the pilot comes on and reminds you uh, what flight you're on in case you're on the right, uh, to make sure you're on the right flight. Uh, so for those of you who think you're at AEI listening to Dick Cheney, um, <laughs> This, this is a different flight. Um, look, I, all of you know uh, a lot about this deal. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going into the nuts and bolts of it. I'm going to spend most of the time in my formal remarks talking about some of the most prominent criticisms of the deal. Uh, but as you're all aware from day one, uh, uh, with the possible exception of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, no other national security issue has received as much attention from President Obama and the rest of the administration as the quest to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, we put in place a very effective dual-track strategy that blended crippling sanctions and direct diplomacy, and the result was uh, the JCPOA, the comprehensive nuclear deal with Iran that was announced on July 14th and is now under review in the Congress. Uh, obviously, it is our view and the view of the vast majority of experts inside and outside the government that this is a good deal. It's a good deal for the United States. It's a good deal for the world. Uh, and it's a good deal for our allies uh, in the region, uh, including Israel. Um, it's a good deal because, as Daryl mentioned at the outset, it closes off uh, all the various pathways whereby Iran uh, might acquire nuclear weapons. It puts significant long-term constraints on Iran's uh, uh, enrichment program, uh, blocking a uranium path to a bomb. 
it requires fundamental uh, changes in the design of the ARAC uh, heavy water research reactor uh, and requires that uh, the spent fuel from that reactor to be shipped out for the life uh, of, of the ARAC reactor, closing off the plutonium path uh, using that reactor forever. And it puts in place the most intrusive uh, verification and transparency measures ever negotiated, um, including 24-7 surveillance of Iran's key nuclear sites, regular IAEA access to the entire nuclear supply chain. That means mines, mills, conversion facilities, centrifuge production facilities, and all uh, of their nuclear facilities, which effectively makes it impossible for Iran to divert materials from their known program to a covert program. It also has a mechanism to ensure that IAEA inspectors have timely access to any site in Iran where we suspect Iran is engaged in suspicious activities and a mechanism to ensure that no combination of Russia, China, or Iran could block those inspections. In exchange for rolling back uh, their nuclear program and putting in place these transparency measures, Iran will receive some sanctions relief associated with nuclear-related sanctions. But there will be no sanctions relief until the IAEA validates, verifies, that Iran has completed all of the key nuclear steps asked of it uh, in the first part of the agreement. If Iran violates its commitment now or in the future, we have a procedure to unilaterally reimpose or snap back sanctions. We can do that in the United Nations. We can do it here at home unilaterally through U.S. domestic sanctions and working with our partners in the EU. So if Iran cheats, we'll know it, and there will be consequences. So that's kind of the top line of the deal. You're all uh, uh, aware of that. Uh, on its merits, I think it's unquestionably a good deal, a very good deal. But I think it would be more useful uh, now that Congress has returned and are about to have a pretty full-throated debate on this deal uh, this week uh, to maybe focus the remainder of re my remarks on three major criticisms. There are many more criticisms that, that you hear, but I want to focus on three of the most prominent ones. One is uh, uh, the notion that somehow after year 15 in the deal, Iran is allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. Right? Second, that the deal provides a windfall of cash for Iran that they can use to spread uh, terrorism, mischief, subversion, militancy uh, throughout the Middle East, threatening Israel and our other allies. And third, the notion that if we walk away from this deal, we can get a better one. So let me focus on those three major critiques. Some of our critics assert that the deal actually paves the way to an Iranian bomb because after 15 years, certain constraints on their program end. So let's be clear about two things. First, under this deal, Iran is never allowed to build nuclear weapons. Never. And second, Iran already has a path to the bomb, or what Colin Powell recently called a superhighway to a bomb. And without this deal, they can get there in months, not decades. Now, it is the case that some constraints on Iran's enrichment program under the deal loosen as Iran builds confidence over many years in the exclusively peaceful nature of their program. As a member of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the NPT, Iran is allowed to access nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. But under the NPT, Iran is never allowed to produce nuclear weapons. That permanent obligation is reinforced by specific commitments under this deal, including permanent bans on research and development relevant to designing a nuclear warhead. Iran is never allowed to produce weapons-grade uranium. They are never allowed to produce weapons-grade plutonium for a bomb either. And if they expand their activities in ways that are inconsistent with the peaceful program at any time, I have no doubt that this president or any future president would respond. The intrusive transparency and inspections measures in this deal also stretch far beyond 15 years. Some of them last 20 to 25 years, and others, like the additional protocol, which allows the IAEA extensive access uh, to Iranian sites, last in perpetuity. And if at any point, at any point, 16 years from now, 18 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, Iran moves towards a nuclear weapon or takes steps that are inconsistent with a peaceful program. Every single option we have today, including the military option, will exist for a future president of the United States. And some of those options, frankly, will be better as our capabilities and intelligence improve over time. So this notion that Iran can waltz into the front door of the nuclear club after 15 years is nonsense. What about the second critique, that the plan somehow enables Iranian mischief by giving them a windfall of cash? There's no doubt that this is a serious issue and one we have to remain vigilant against. 
But let's be honest. To argue that we can't lift any nuclear-related sanctions until Iran stops all of its nefarious activities outside the nuclear domain is really saying that we should never strike a nuclear deal with this regime. All right, so let's be honest about what this critique is. If you can never lift any nuclear-related sanctions until Iran stops everything that we don't like, it's basically saying there will never be a nuclear deal. I'm not a fan of this regime either. But as troublesome as they are, as anti-Semitic as their rhetoric is, as horrible as their support for terrorism, subversion, and other activities are, these dangers would be exponentially worse if Iran acquired a nuclear weapon and could use the cover of a nuclear umbrella and a nuclear deterrent to shield their destabilizing activities. That's why we focused, first and foremost, on eliminating this threat. Our critics also exaggerate the amount of money Iran is likely to get. They have about $100 billion trapped in these overseas escrow accounts from the, in the countries uh, that continue to buy Iranian oil. But of that money, our Treasury Department estimates they will only be able to access a little over $50, $50 billion. Our intelligence community and Treasury Department also calculate that Iran will have to spend the vast majority of this money on domestic needs because they have a half a trillion dollars in urgent infrastructure uh, and other economic requirements. And while we don't think of Iran as a democracy, there are real politics there, and Rouhani got elected on a platform of saving the Iranian economy by breaking its isolation and, and removing sanctions, and the Supreme Leader would never have endorsed this deal unless he felt the same. So there are powerful economic and political imperatives to spend this money on domestic issues. Does that mean there will be none left over for the Iranian military or the Revolutionary Guard? No, it doesn't. It is certainly possible uh, that Iran could spend some of the cash from sanctions relief uh, to uh, funnel towards uh, actors that we don't like. Of course, this was always going to be a challenge if we ever got a nuclear deal, because the price of getting a nuclear deal was, was uh, removing some of the sanctions. How Iran ultimately chooses to use its money regionally will depend in part on how the factional competition within Iran plays out. I can kind of argue this round or flat. You can tell a story about how the deal uh, could enable pragmatists and moderates to get the upper hand and eventually claw back uh, 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 more control over foreign policy away uh, from Qasem Soleimani and the Revolutionary Guard. You can tell a story about how sanctions relief and more integration into the international community would allow engagement and moderation via the Iranian people, who still remain overwhelmingly pro-American. But I can also tell the story the opposite way. Right? that the Supreme Leader compensates for the nuclear deal by doubling down on his support for the hardliners and funneling some of the money in their direction. I think we have to be honest, it could break either way, which is why we, this deal wasn't premised on a bet that Iran would change its stripes. And it's why this, this deal is not a grand bargain with Iran, nor is it a permission slip for Iran to dominate the region. During the Cold War, recall that we confronted an enemy that was an evil empire, that controlled huge swaths of the globe, that literally killed tens of thousands of Americans and hundreds of thousands of American allies, that subverted our allies in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, and in Central America. And yet we still struck deals with that regime to reduce the risk of nuclear war. In the 70s and 80s, under Democratic and Republican administrations, out of recognition that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that it is possible to strike arms control agreements with our adversaries, in ways that make us safer while continuing to push back against their destabilizing activities elsewhere. And that's what we will commit to do moving forward. A big part of this means continuing to sanction Iranian entities that commit acts of terrorism or engage in human rights violations. None of our ability to do that goes away as a consequence of this deal. A big part of that includes continuing to stand by our allies, Israel and our Arab partners, especially in the Gulf. Look, I know that there are significant policy disagreements with the Israeli government. By the way, that's not unique. If you look at the history books, there have been lots of American administrations that have not always seen eye to eye uh, with Israeli governments. But one thing is beyond question, and that is that no administration in history has done more for Israel's security than this administration. No president in history has done more for Israel's security than this president. We've worked with Congress to provide more than $3 billion to Israel every single year in foreign military assistance. We've worked uh, to provide them another billion dollars on top of that for missile defense systems 
including Iron Dome that has saved countless Israeli lives from rockets fired by Iranian proxies. We've taken unprecedented steps to ensure Israel maintains its qualitative military edge against all potential adversaries, including Iran, by giving uh, Israel, providing them access to technology like the F-35 stealth fighter, which no other actor in the region possesses. We've also offered for months now to engage in, in discussions at the highest levels about what more we can do in the areas of intelligence and security cooperation with the Israeli government. And when the Israeli government is prepared to engage in that conversation, uh, we'll be there. We've also done taken actions to stand by our Arab partners. As I speak, there are 35,000 American forces in the Gulf region defending our interests, defending our friends, and making sure that the that commerce flows freely through one of the most important straits in the world. It's also why the president convened our Gulf partners at Camp David and also the meeting that he had with the King of Saudi Arabia just last week to explore ways we can expand our security cooperation to build their capacities on things like cyber defense and critical infrastructure protection and maritime interdiction and ballistic missile defense and to conduct special operations all so that they have greater capabilities to push back against any country's destabilizing activities in the region. What about the notion that if we just walk away from this deal, we can achieve a better one? By the way, let's be clear what the better one is frequently described as. The better one that our critics usually uh, describe as a deal that, instead of limiting Iran's program, dismantles their civilian nuclear program forever, and conditions any lifting of sanctions to include nuclear-related sanctions on Iran changing all of its behavior we don't like. All right, that's the better deal. Drive them to zero forever and don't lift a single sanction until they stop doing everything we don't like. All right. Let's be frank. Even that deal wouldn't satisfy our critics. Do you know why? Because at the heart, they don't believe Iran will comply with any deal, which means even if they drove their program to zero, those same critics would argue, you can't trust Iran, they won't follow through, and they would still argue against their own better deal. Let's be clear about another thing. The rest of the world believes this deal is the better deal. The rest of the world believes this deal is the better deal. If we walk away now, there is no chance, zero of the rest of the world going along with us. As Brent Scrocroft said, if we walk away, we walk away alone. Keep in mind, the sanctions that we have put in place on Iran are not only costly on Iran. They are costly on countries that want to do business with Iran or buy oil from them. Other countries have gone along with these sanctions, especially during the Obama administration, because they have agreed with our policy objectives of seeking a diplomatic solution to the nuclear issue. And they've also believed our promise that sanctions would eventually be lifted when we got the kind of nuclear deal that we now have in front of us. During the 1990s, we had secondary sanctions on Iran's energy sector, which the rest of the world ignored because they didn't agree with our policy objectives. We've seen this movie before. If we walk away, it's hard to see it's hard to see us keeping the international coalition currently isolating Iran together. Europe would be divided. Russia would undoubtedly bolt. And many Asian countries, especially China and India, would be eager to buy Iran's oil again. Consequently, sanctions will erode and the international consensus around our Iran policy will collapse. And guess what? You can't drive to a better deal with less leverage and less international support. It defies the laws of political gravity. More broadly, killing the deal would cripple our global leadership. My boss, the vice president, uh, often remarks that as he travels the world, and he's gone to, I think, almost every, world, uh, every country in the world across more than 40 years in foreign policy, he says the one thing that he hears more than anything else these days, and I've heard my fair share of this as well, is concerns about whether the United States can govern. It's not a question about our power. We are the most powerful country in the world. We have the most powerful military. We have the most dynamic economy. We have the most vibrant population. Nobody doubts that we remain the world's indispensable power. What they doubt is whether we can govern. 
So if Congress wipes away this deal, either through the actions this week or through future legislation aimed to tank this deal, others around the world will ask whether we can live up to our commitments and exercise the kind of leadership they expect of us. So if we walk away now, we will all be in a world of hurt. We, not the Iranians, will be isolated. Iran will be less constrained to advance its nuclear program, and there is a very real chance that we could be on a path either to an Iranian nuclear weapon, a military confrontation, or both. Now, there may be some, although I suspect not in this room, who prefer the path of armed conflict against this regime. While no one should doubt or question America's capability and will to do what it takes to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, that is the policy of this administration, I have no doubt it will be the policy of future administrations, no military strike will set back Iran's program a fraction of what this deal accomplishes. And no one, after a decade plus of war, should be cavalier about the costs and consequences of yet another war in the Middle East, especially, especially when we have a peaceful diplomatic solution at hand that does so much more to keep us safe. Thanks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes or so for your questions, and um, Shervin will bring forward the microphone uh, if and when you raise your hand for a question. We have one up front right here on the this side. Thanks. Please identify yourself. Sure. Yeah. Sam Gilston with the Export Practitioner. Uh, the American business community is concerned that uh, the continued uh, uh, implementation of existing sanctions on Iran for terrorism and um, uh, human rights abuse will put them at a disadvantage with European and, and Russian Chinese business that won't have the same sanctions in place. Uh, what will the administration do as far as guidance and implementation regulations to give U.S. business uh, somewhat of the same opportunities in Iran, if at all, uh, that Europeans and others are going to get? Yeah, I, th I think we have to be clear that American businesses are not going to have the same opportunities that other, country, that other countries' businesses have. I mean, under, under this agreement, uh, the vast majority of our uh, bilateral sanctions on the ability of U.S. persons and businesses to do business with Iran, period, don't go away. Uh, so it's not just a byproduct of future terrorism or human rights sanctions. It's the fact that uh, uh, that sanctions architecture will remain in place. There are certain things like licenses for civilian aircraft, uh, some trade like in carpets and pistachios and other things which will be enabled. And who knows where this thing will go, especially if Iran moderates its, its behavior down the road. Uh, but, yes, American businesses will not be in the same place as, as European and Asian uh, uh, businesses. Um, I mean, part of this is that's going to have to emerge. Those opportunities are going to have to emerge uh, in the context of where, whether Iran changes some of its fundamental orientation and behavior. Um, I should also say, from a national security perspective, I don't think we want to um, take the view that it's not important to continue to put in place uh, designations and sanctions against entities that, from this point forward, in Iran engage in terrorism and human rights abuses. This deal is a nuclear deal. It's not about the rest of their activities. And if Iran continues to foment terrorism around the world, and uh, the Treasury Department will continue to go after the entities that, that do that. Okay. Uh, I mean, one, one related question yeah. here, if I might ask, Colin, is, um, I mean, this brings up the issue of uh, the implementation process and how the administration is going to be managing this. I mean, this is a multi-year agreement, many different moving parts. Um, one question that we've been getting quite a lot lately is, you know, whether the administration is going to set up a dedicated office to uh, deal with the various issues, including the joint uh, commission, uh, dealing with some of the, the sanctions, uh, relief uh, issues and, and management issues. So could you give us a sense of what the thinking is about, uh, I mean, how much attention the administration is going to give to that and, and, and how that implementation work might uh, proceed in the coming months? Sure. This is actually an issue we've been working on for months. Um, in the last uh, two or three months of the negotiating period, we had a completely parallel track with a completely s separate set of folks uh, uh, based out of, the, out of the State Department, uh, but it was an interagency team focusing on um, what would be required to implement the deal. Now, even before the details of the deal uh, were, were, were finalized. So this is something we've been thinking about uh, for a long time. Uh, we will have a dedicated uh, uh, senior official 
um, uh, with high-level contact uh, to the Secretary of State and, and, and the President and others. There will be an interagency team. Uh, and obviously, a lot of the resources that we already have devoted to the Iran question and the intel side and other things uh, are directly relevant to monitoring and verifying uh, the agreement as well. So um, without going into too many of the specifics, uh, the, the, the short answer is yes, there will be a very robust uh, implementation team uh, and it's already in train. But I don't want to do kind of the cart before the horse thing because we have to get through the ANARA uh, review process with Congress and once we get on the back end of that, I think it's in all of our interest to have a pretty full-throated conversation about implementation. All right. All right. We've got a couple of questions here. We'll start in the, the back, and then we'll come forward, please. Hi. Uh, Christine Parthmore, Center for American Progress. Um, are threat reduction programs focused on countering weapons mass destruction threats in the Middle East really just started a few years ago in earnest? I'm wondering if focusing past the current debate in Congress and looking at implementation, if there's thought being put into expanding those programs as a way of bolstering regional stability and improving the capabilities uh, for countering all WMD threats for some of the neighboring countries. Okay. And then why don't we take uh, Tom's question up here, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Colin, I'm Tom Cochran. I'm not suggesting walking back the, the deal, but I'd I'm, I'm be curious why the P5 plus one didn't offer Iran a fuel bank of final assembled assemblies, say a 10 or more year supply for free stockpiled in Iran, and then suggest that they use that period to negotiate a fuel cycle that wouldn't be threatening to others? Yeah. Both good questions. Uh, so, Christine, great to see you again. Christine and I used to work together a long time ago at the Center for a New American Security. Uh, and then Christine did a bunch of great work on, on counter WMD stuff at the, at the Pentagon. Um, I think it's a great question, actually. Uh, there are, as we move through implementation, I mean, there are, there are going to be uh, sensitive trade and sensitive technologies, not only in the nuclear area, but obviously things that could be relevant. Uh, to chemical and biological weapons, not exclusively with Iran, but across, uh, across the region. And as I think as we um, think about policing certain elements of this agreement, like the procurement channel and making sure that Iran does not get access to illicit technologies, that we should bring to bear every tool in our toolkit to include uh, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these things. I also think, obviously, we have to be mindful of other countries that may pursue uh, uh, WMD. Um, I mean, one of the things we've tried to be, look, we think this is a, this, we think this is a very good deal. But what we've tried to be honest about is it doesn't solve every problem with Iran and it doesn't solve every problem in the Middle East. So we're going to continue to have to work on all the issues that, uh, that you worked on uh, to include in WMD beyond the contours of this uh, particular deal. Tom, it's a great question. You know, um, I think we, I think, look, I think in a perfect world, Iran would have zero fuel domestic indigenous fuel cycle activities. They wouldn't engage in any domestic enrichment, uh, uh, period. Um, of course, we, we, the U.S. government, ran that play uh, in uh, 2003, 2004, 2005 uh, during an earlier stage of negotiations uh, with the Iranians uh, where the Iranians basically temporarily froze their program and then came back to the Europeans who were leading negotiations at a time to propose a deal that in many respects looks like the current uh, uh, deal. And the Bush administration in 2005 rejected uh, that as viable because they demanded zero enrichment. Um, so I don't know that, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to demand zero domestic enrichment in Iran for years and it hasn't worked. And part of the issue is that Iran has a, a very strong culture and identity of self-reliance. They're not the only country in the Middle East uh, to have a culture uh, uh, like that. But they think of themselves uh, as a great civilization, as a great scientific and technological leader, and have for a long time. And I know that's not everybody's image uh, of, uh, of Iran, uh, but it's their image of themselves. And, the reason, and, and they also have a narrative about how, uh, you know, basically the international community has reneged on a whole series of deals uh, throughout the life of the Islamic Republic and even before that. So it's very difficult, given that mindset, to get them in a place where they would be wholly reliant on international sources of fuel, uh, which is one of the reasons why I think the zero enrichment uh, option was never never proved uh, all that viable. So we explored that. Um, uh, it just 
it wasn't something that we could get uh, the Iranians and the rest of the P5 plus one uh, to sign on to. So instead, we are shrunk their program uh, to contain it in, in, in a way that I think prevents them from getting a nuclear weapon, but through a different pathway, a different route. All right, we got a couple questions over here, and then we'll take this third one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Call. Uh, I'm Ali Dodd Mafinez. Um, a uh, question has to do with the fact that it seems the uh, deal is in the bag, uh, given what's happened in the Senate over the past few days. Uh, and uh, because of that, it seems like the remaining 16 months of the Obama administration are anything but a lame duck. And the question then becomes, uh, are there discussions underway uh, among your colleagues and yourself regarding the real security threat in that region, which is the uh, calamity that's unfolding, has been unfolding in Syria and Iraq and Yemen, uh, and whether you think the success, the historic achievement that has been uh, experienced uh, by the U.S., uh, led by the U.S., can be parlayed into uh, a resolution or some kind of uh, uh, deal uh, bringing in the uh, various countries in the region. Thank you. All right, and then let's take uh, Richard's question, please, right up front. Richard. Oh, yeah. Richard. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Colin, you mentioned three critiques uh, of the agreement, um, but there's and there are, as you say, many others. I wanted to ask if you would uh, provide your perspective on the critique about the uh, Iran IAEA agreement, sort of the path forward uh, to resolve the issue of uh, possible military dimensions to previous historical Iranian nuclear work, um, since that has been uh, at times a, a big stumbling block for some in Congress. Uh, and a lot of, uh, I think, misimpressions and misinformation have been out there in the public domain. All right. Great. Uh, Aladad, um, actually, I think we've done a lot since the uh, last wave of, of congressional elections to demonstrate that this administration is not a lame duck administration in the area of foreign policy, Cuba, uh, the Iran deal, obviously getting trade promotion authority through the Congress and, I, and hopefully heading towards uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which would be an historic uh, trade agreement that would link together economies that make up some 40% uh, of the world's economy. That's some serious business uh, uh, to get uh, to get done. So I think um, the president said we're in the fourth quarter and big things happen in the fourth quarter. Um, whether, uh, you know, how this deal plays out as it relates to Syria, um, I think is TBD. Uh, there's no question that um, what's going on in Syria is incredibly disturbing and heartbreaking. Um, if there were easy answers, I mean, I know some of our proponents uh, think, you know, you drop a few bombs here, you put up a no-fly zone there and snap your fingers and the war will go uh, go away. Um, as someone who used to oversee uh, these types of things at the Pentagon in the first three years of the administration, I can tell you that's not that's not true. And our, uh, but uh, whether this deal allows us to, to pivot into a different diplomatic space on Syria, it's, it's completely unclear. Um, you know, a lot of that ball is in fundamentally in, in Iran's court. Um, up to this point, uh, more pragmatic actors like Rouhani and Zarif have really, you know, while they've been predominant in the nuclear file, they've been less predominant on the regional file as a whole, where uh, the Revolutionary Guard and certain hardline elements uh, have certainly been more up front, uh, more in the vanguard of Iran's uh, activities. So, you know, uh, we're certainly not going to in a sense, cut a deal with Iran at the, at the, at the expense of the people in Syria or the rest of, of the region. The fundamental question is whether Iran's calculation is starting to change. And uh, we don't know yet. Um, but there, one thing is, is clear. Um, I think the Syrian regime is probably under more battlefield pressure than at any time since at least 2012. Um, if you look at a map, uh, they've lost a lot of territory. They're kind of besieged by, uh, by all sides. I do think the Iranians and the Russians uh, are worried about that. Um, whether that uh, creates a moment uh, for us to uh, figure out a viable political transition, uh, which is ultimately what's going to be required to end this conflict, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, but if the Iranians and the, Russian, and the Russians are, are willing to engage in a serious conversation about that, um, you know, then we'll engage in that conversation alongside our other partners in the region like Turkey and Saudi Arabia and, and, and others. Richard. Uh, Yes, I didn't talk about the conspiracy theories of the secret side deals uh, uh, struck uh, between the IAEA uh, and Iran um, on the PMD issue, the possible military dimensions issue. 
Um, this is one of the greater uh, uh, misconceptions. Um, there are no side deals. There are no pieces of paper in our possession that have not been given uh, to Congress. It is there, uh, all of the general requirements that Iran has to meet to provide access to uh, the people, places, and documents necessary for the IAEA to complete its investigation into PMD are spelled out in the roadmap, which is available uh, to members of Congress. It is true that there is a technical annex or technical document that does the kind of TikTok of when, where, how uh, of that. Uh, it's an IAEA document with the Iranians. It's quote unquote safeguards confidential as all IAEA documents of its type are to include the ones they have with us. There are reasons why documents like that don't get published, published on the interwebs, uh, and that's because you don't want uh, the world's rogue states and terrorists to learn about every other country's nuclear uh, program. We have an interest in the IA not publicizing our information either. But because this information was so important to us, we were briefed in detail on the plan, and we have in turn briefed any member of Congress uh, who, uh, uh, who wants to know about it. I don't know if you read uh, Congresswoman uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz's uh, op-ed the other day, but she remarked that she was very uh, concerned about some of the reporting about side deals and, and self-inspections at Parchin and everything else until she got the briefing uh, on it, and, uh, and then she, her concerns were, were put aside. So there's no side deals, there's no secret deals, there's no self-inspections, there's a process uh, for the IAEA to get the access they need to conclude their investigation. Last point I would make is, um, let's all keep in mind, though, that this is about a, pa a set of past activities that we already know about. Right? This isn't really about getting more information. It's about establishing the precedent that the IAEA can get access to facilities moving forward if they suspect that illicit activities. And I'm satisfied and we're satisfied uh, that the arrangements that the IAEA has with, with Iran uh, on this issue uh, are good enough and that uh, moving forward they're very strong. All right. Two quick questions, and we're going to have to close. I'm sorry. Um, maybe, Joe, if you're really nice right. to me. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, thank you very much. Benjamin Tour, retired Foreign Service officer. Could you speak to the uh, likelihood that supporters of the deal will be able to muster the 41 votes to block a vote opposing the deal to get out of the Congress? All right. And then one question right here. And then we'll go to a third, and then we'll ask Colin to answer all three. Thank you for, for doing this. Um, I'm uh, Tomo Inoue from Kyoto News, Japan. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, so uh, Iranian President Rouhani is coming to New York uh, later this month. Uh, so uh, do you think it's a good idea for President Obama to have um, uh, direct talks with him to promote the deal and discuss other is security issues in the region? Thank you. All right. And then, uh, Colin, if I could just tag on to the, the first question, um, which is related to whether uh, there will be 41 uh, votes in support. Uh, some members of Congress um, have uh, hinted that they're going to be offering legislation uh, that, uh, in my view, seeks to try to modify the terms of the JCPOA, uh, extend some sanctions uh, uh, provisions. Um, one of them is Senator Cardin of Maryland. Could you comment on what you all know about uh, Senator Cardin's um, bill and similar efforts uh, to try to um, kind of adjust the terms of, of, of the agreement, please? And Joe, last but not least, you were going to ask about Cardin too? Look at that, syncopatico. Uh, Benjamin, 41 votes. Uh, I'm not trying to be glib. You'll know when we know. Uh, we've put the full court press on all the undecideds. Uh, there's only a handful left. We'll, we'll, we'll know uh, in the next few days uh, whether we get to 41 uh, uh, or not. Um, on the Rouhani, Obama, UNGA uh, possibility for direct talks, um, I have no idea. Uh, and I certainly don't have anything to announce. Um, uh, Carton. Um, Yes, uh, I, there, there is some interest, I think, on the Hill uh, uh, to have some standalone legislation uh, separate from the Inara uh, review process on the deal itself. Um, they would put in place a combination of uh, security assurances to uh, our allies and a set of clarifications and other issues related to implementation uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the deal. Um, look, I think we have made clear uh, consistently that we want to work with Congress 
on legislation that will help implement this deal because implementation is really important. We've also been clear with Congress and with our allies and partners uh, that we want to move forward on deepening our already extraordinarily robust uh, security assistance and cooperation relationships with Israel uh, and our Arab partners. Uh, so we're ready to work with Congress uh, on that. I, I'll repeat something I said during my remarks. I mean, we've had numerous conversations with the Israeli government for months already, uh, and those have basically been put on hold by them uh, until we get beyond the Iran deal uh, uh, process. Um, as it relates to any particular piece of legislation, like the draft legislation that Senator Cardin has been involved in, I, I don't want to litigate every, every line of it. I'll just say that the draft that I've seen um, is quite problematic. It has uh, it, it undoubtedly does some good things, uh, but it has a number of very problematic interpretations about the actual terms of the JCPOA, um, which are just at odds with, with uh, the explicit language uh, in the JCPOA. Um, it has uh, some things on the sanctions front uh, that I think uh, the P5 plus one uh, and Iran uh, might see as inconsistent um, with uh, some of the obligations uh, under the JCPOA. And at the very least, it has a number of provisions in it that are quite provocative and not unnecessarily so at a time when what we should all be focused on once we get beyond this review is how to effectively implement this deal. Because our, our number one uh, uh, national security objective as it relates to Iran's nuclear program at this, once we get beyond the review, is implementing the deal and making it effective. And so it strikes me as an odd moment uh, to put in place legislation that is unnecessary, gratuitous, and provocative. Uh, so um, without prejudging every part of the, of, of the legislation, because there were certainly parts of the, of the, of the draft that uh, were reasonable and, and seemed like uh, good ideas, uh, there were a bunch of other things that were much more problematic. Great. All right. Well, we um, are out of time for this uh, segment of our program. Uh, I want to ask everybody to join me in thanking Colin for an excellent uh, tour de force presentation for your hard work on this issue. Um, and we will reconvene at 11 a.m. with our next panel of uh, George Perkovich, Kelsey Davenport, Ellie Jarnmaya, uh, after the halftime show of uh, Senator uh, Harry Reid, who will be speaking upstairs on some of these congressional issues. So. Please uh, join me in thanking Colin. Thank you. Very much. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I am still Daryl Kimball, still the executive director of the Arms Control Association. Uh, we welcome you back to the uh, second half of our program on why the Iran nuclear deal is a win for nuclear proliferation and security. Um, I hope that many of you. Uh, Appreciated the comments that uh, Minority Leader Reed just made upstairs, uh, the earlier remarks from Colin Call. And now we're going to turn to um, our panel uh, to talk about uh, the implications of the agreement, what the agreement does. We're actually going to talk a little bit of substance here. Uh, we're also going to talk about the congressional debate uh, that is uh, about to erupt. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the legislation that's been referred to this morning uh, from Senator Cardin. Uh, and others, uh, and to, to do all of this, we have uh, a great lineup uh, this morning, uh, beginning with Kelsey Davenport, who is the Director for Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association. Uh, Kelsey has been um, uh, tireless in her efforts over the last uh, couple of years uh, researching uh, the subject, uh, attending the talks in Vienna. Geneva and elsewhere, and um, is the, the co-author of the report that we published last month, uh, Solving the Iran Nuclear Puzzle. Uh, and she's going to start us off with a review of what this agreement actually does and why it's a, uh, a net plus for, for nonproliferation. We're also very pleased to have uh, Ellie Jaramaya, uh, who's a policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, um, who, like uh, virtually everybody else from Europe who's been working on this issue, has come to Washington. Uh, to join in the fun uh, in the next couple of weeks as uh, the United States Congress begins uh, working at this issue. Um, she has uh, been also focusing intensively on uh, this issue, on uh, how it's going to impact uh, regional dynamics, uh, and is going to be presenting uh, her analysis on how uh, governments in Europe uh, look at this issue and I think you'll find that it's a little bit different from uh, many uh, here in Washington, not all. Uh, and so we're very pleased to have her perspectives um, 
uh, here this morning. And then also George Perkovich, fresh from his introductory duties uh, uh, upstairs uh, with uh, Senator Reed. Uh, George, uh, longtime uh, collaborator here at the Carnegie Endowment for National Peace, is the Vice President for Studies. Uh, and he has been working for decades on the problem of nuclear proliferation uh, and disarmament uh, and uh, has been looking closely at the Iran deal. And so he's going to offer his perspective on uh, the situation uh, today and uh, with the debate on the JCPOA and what's ahead. So uh, to begin, uh, Chelsea, please uh, take it away. The podium is yours. And uh, we're going to go, uh, let me just remind folks, um, you know, each speaker will speak for a little less than 10 minutes or so, so that we've got some time for, for Q&A uh, from you all uh, this morning. Chelsea. Thank you, thank you Daryl, and thank you all for staying with us today and spending most of your morning looking at the Iran deal. I want to talk today a little bit about what the Iran deal does and then address one of the fundamental concerns about the agreement, and that's what happens after year 15. And there I really want to make two points. One, that the restrictions that remain past year 15 will provide a significant amount of information and early warning about any changes to Iran's nuclear program. And also that there are a number of steps that can be taken both by the United States, the international community, and within the region to strengthen the nonproliferation value of the deal itself. So first, just to reiterate a little bit about what we heard both from Colin Call and Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid this morning, particularly for the first decade, the Iran nuclear deal is extremely strong from a nonproliferation perspective. Currently, if Iran wanted to produce enough fuel for a bomb, it could do so in about two months. Under this deal, that timeline will be pushed back to over a year because Iran's enrichment capacity will be cut in half. All of the additional centrifuges will be stored under seal. And Iran's stockpile of enriched material will be dramatically reduced down to 300 kilograms, just a fraction of what is necessary uh, for a nuclear bomb. And also, Iran will only be enriching to reactor grade levels about 3.67% uh, for 15 years. Uh, the plutonium pathway, even stronger, Iran will have to remove the core of the Iraq reactor and replace it with another core that will produce very little weapons-grade plutonium. And for the next 15 years, Iran will not build any reactors that would produce that type of fuel. Uh, as Colin noted this morning as well, the monitoring and verification is extremely strong, the strongest ever agreed to in a nonproliferation deal. Uh, every element of Iran's nuclear supply chain, from the uranium mines to the enrichment, will be under continuous surveillance. And the International Atomic Energy Agency, through the additional protocol and additional restrictions in the deal, will be able to access sites if there are concerns about illicit nuclear activity within a time frame of 24 days, which is unheard of. So very strong, particularly within the first 15 years of the deal. However, after 15 years, some of these restrictions begin to come off. Iran can increase its uranium enrichment capacity. Uh, the limits on centrifuges expire. The limits on stockpile expire. And that leads some critics of the deal to say Iran will be very close to a nuclear weapon, and even some supporters of the deal to express concern about what Iran's uranium enrichment program will look like after 15 years. However, I think the idea that Iran will dramatically ramp up its uranium enrichment at that point is not a foregone conclusion. First, if Iran does decide to ramp up enrichment, there will be a number of indicators that will demonstrate what Iran intends to do. First, I think it's important to note that the continuous surveillance on Iran's centrifuge production areas lasts for 20 years. Uh, the continuous surveillance on Iran's uranium mines and mills lasts for 25 years. Taken together, these will provide an early indication of what types of advanced centrifuges Iran is producing uh, and in what numbers. There are also a number of restrictions that are permanent. And we have up here on the screen a chart that appears in our briefing book. And I know the type here is probably too small to see, but what I want you to note is that a number of these provisions with the arrows demonstrate permanent provisions that this deal puts on Iran. 
Uh, one of the most important, I think, does not receive enough attention in discussions of the deal. And that's in section, uh, or Annex 1, Section T of the agreement, where Iran commits not to undertake certain activities related to weaponization, even if those activities have conventional purposes. Essentially, this prevents some of the scenarios that we've seen in the past, where Iran has conducted certain types of explosive experiments and said that they were conventional, pur for conventional purposes. Iran will not be able to do this uh, in the future. Also, some of the monitoring and verification mechanisms that are so crucial will also be permanent. Iran will have to adhere to a mechanism known as Code 3.1, which requires it to immediately notify the International Atomic Energy Agency when it intends to build a new nuclear facility. That gives the agency time to adjust and develop an appropriate safeguards approach. The additional protocol will also be permanent because Iran needs to ratify that within the first eight years of the deal. And that's an extremely important me mechanism that the International Atomic Energy Agency can use to request access to any site within Iran if there are concerns about illicit activity. Uh, Iran can take some steps to safeguard sensitive information, but ultimately, with this measure in place, it will be up to the International Atomic Energy Agency to determine uh, whether or not it receives appropriate access to ensure that Iran's program uh, is entirely peaceful and that there are no illicit activities. So these are just some of the permanent measures that will give the international community a greater picture of where Iran's program is going after 15 years and provide an early warning of any significant changes to Iran's program. But like I said, it's not a foregone conclusion that after 15 years, Iran will decide to dramatically ramp up its enrichment program. And I think it would behoove the United States, the international community, and the Middle East to consider steps uh, both at the regional level and at the international level, to head off uh, such enrichment, uh, to, to head off and disincentivize Iran from pursuing uh, a, a much larger in enrichment program. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is that Iran has said in the past that some of the restrictions under this deal it would be willing to adhere to in perpetuity if other countries in the region were willing to accept those terms. Uh, the restriction on enrichment to reactor grade levels, for instance. Iran has said it would permanently cap its program at 3.67% enrichment if other countries in the region did the same. Let's take the next 15 years to test that intention, to work with other countries in the region, perhaps as a confidence-building step towards the Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone, to see if it's possible to put such a ban region-wide. Some of the additional monitoring and transparency measures, including some of the continuous monitoring on enrichment, Iran has also said it would accept in perpetuity if other countries in the region uh, were willing to accept similar constraints if they chose to pursue enrichment. That's another area that can be tested as a possible confidence-building measure. Also, I think region-wide, there is some space to look at things like multi uh, multilateral enrichment. Uh, there's an excellent piece in science uh, from some of the scholars at Princeton that explores this in more detail. But if other countries in the region are looking at pursuing nuclear programs, having them buy into the Iran, Iran's enrichment program would provide additional oversight uh, and ensure that there's guaranteed fuel supplies for the region. So that's another area that I think can be explored within the next 15 years. There are also elements that the United States and the larger international community can and should take to strengthen this deal and hopefully head off any sort of Iranian uh, enrichment on a larger scale after year 15. Uh, right now, Iran's sole nuclear power reactor at Bushir is supplied by the Russians. Uh, Russia has also entered into a memorandum of understanding for additional reactors with Iran and has said it would supply those for the, the lifetime of the reactor. Uh, we know that China is interested also in reactor contracts. Encouraging countries to provide lifetime fuel for reactors, uh, not only in Iran, but in the Middle East, uh, or really with any sale of reactors, uh, disincentivizes the need for enrichment. 
Uh, we certainly know from Iran's past experiences uh, with its investment in Eurodif, uh, for instance, that it has had experiences in the past where the international community has not delivered uh, on nuclear fuel. So these permanent fuel supply guarantees will ensure that Iran has the fuel that it needs for its reactors. Also, I think when the United States and other countries that supply nuclear reactors uh, to any country in the region or the rest of the world, uh, should ensure that these countries have an additional protocol in place. Uh, right now in the United States, that's not a requirement of the U.S. Atomic Energy Act. Uh, that is an area where the U.S. could strengthen uh, its own norms uh, and prevent then the further proliferation uh, of some of these technologies within the region. There are also a number of multilateral voluntary control regimes that could be strengthened. Uh, the Proliferation Security Initiative, the Missile Technology Control Regime. These would help stem the further transfer of enrichment technologies, of reprocessing technologies, or technologies related to ballistic missile development uh, that could sort of head off future attempts by Iran to pursue solid fuel missiles that pose more of a threat, or intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, once the UN Security Council restrictions on Iran's missile program come off after eight years. Uh, the Proliferation Security Initiative also has some potential in some areas where the international community could take steps uh, to encourage further cooperative action on interdictions and information sharing, both to ensure that technologies within Iran are not spread to non-state actors, and that the established procurement channel that Iran will use for dual-use technologies is not circumvented. So while this agreement is certainly very strong from a non-proliferation perspective, it can be made stronger, and it would behoove the United States to think about the next 15 years, to work with countries in the region, to work with nuclear supplier countries, and take some of these steps that would prevent Iran from dramatically increasing its enrichment after 15 years, or other countries in the region from pursuing enrichment if they are considering their own uh, domestic nuclear power programs. Great, Kelsey. Thank you very much. And uh, another point that I think this chart and, and Kelsey's presentation uh, makes is that uh, uh, there is no clear sunset date by which the JCPOA ends. Uh, this is a multi-part, uh, multi deadline, multi-requirement agreement. Uh, Ellie, it's very good to have you here. Uh, we heard earlier this morning uh, that if the United States were to walk away from this deal, we would be alone. So tell us why that is and, 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 and give us your perspectives on how uh, Europe is looking at this agreement. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back in D.C. where the politics on Iran always has interesting twists and uh, Thank you very much for the invitation. As I said, for the last two years, I've been looking at uh, Europe-Iran relations and how they've been developing since the interim nuclear deal was signed, and looking also at the impact on the regional stakeholders uh, in the Middle East, particularly. And uh, Chelsea and I were joking that it's uh, really nice to see each other outside of lobbies, hotel lobbies, uh, following the nuclear negotiations. So it's good to be here. Um, I wanted to highlight three problems that have arisen with the debate in Congress over the past two months, uh, particularly from a European angle, and also three uh, potential consequences for EU and US foreign policy going forward. Uh, but the headline I wanted to really start off with before that is that for European countries, this deal and this negotiation has always been seen through a multilateral lens. It's one that there are six or potentially seven stakeholders too. And for the, the most advanced nuclear states in Europe, namely the UK and France uh, and Germany, this is as good as a deal is going to get in their perspective. They've also started looking at actively beyond this nuclear-centric lens on Iran and really looking at, one, focusing on implementation of the deal for the 15 to 25-year process and also Beyond that, where European stakes are very high is one, regional security issues in the Middle East, especially the ongoing conflict in Syria, and also trade implications. And really the Europeans, unlike the United States, doesn't have the proximity luxury of being distant from the Middle East. And we've seen uh, the, the blowback for homeland security for Europe in the past year 
with the refugee influx, which is unfortunately being very mishandled, and also impacts of such as Charlie Hebdo, et cetera, et cetera. So they really feel that now shifting to a regional security focus with Iran is their number one priority. At the same time, they're looking at the U.S. debate, which for the last two months has really morphed into one of U.S. domestic politics. Uh, it's not being seen as a multilateral accord. It's being looked at a U.S.-Iran uh, deal, which is entangled, therefore, in a lot of political baggage and historic enmities between these two countries. They've seen the, and the millions of dollars that are being poured by both sides, advocates and opponents of the deal, uh, against, uh, against what the negotiations have uh, created or in defense of them. And really, this debate on this alternative or fantasy deal is just completely absent in Europe at the moment. They're looking at what's next to come. And there's a worrying sense, I think, that Congress really expects Europe to follow suit in whatever is decided within the legislative organ here. Uh, there have been comments uh, that Europe can either be persuaded or coerced into either renegotiating this deal or changing the parameters. And I think this is far from certain. And the tone that's actually come out of this debate uh, I think can have damaging repercussions for the transatlantic unity on sanctions framework going ahead. So three of these uh, problem areas I'd highlight quickly is, firstly, um, Senator Menendez's comments um, and, and repercussions uh, from July where he essentially said that Europeans are frothing at the mouth, I quote, uh, as the business opportunities uh, arising from this deal. And I think a lot of people in Europe have seen this as a stab in the back. Really, Europeans were the ones who started this diplomatic initiative back in 2003 with Solana. They took the bunch of the sanctions framework. It wasn't the U.S., it wasn't Russia or China. It was the Europeans who essentially went from being Iran's first trading partner to its sixth now and even lower. And I think for them, if it was worth taking the cost of sanctions at a time when they were the highest trading partner, they would also do so again now when they're a lower trading partner. So to question, as Senator Menendez did, whether Europeans would be willing to call a violation a violation because of business interests, uh, it certainly took some people by surprise, particularly given the level of cooperation that European companies and uh, policymakers have had with the U.S. Treasury over the past few years. Secondly was uh, comments from Senator Schumer, uh, who's seen you know, in the European scene as quite an influential um, member of the U.S. Congress. And this was in respect of the use of secondary sanctions going forward. Uh, he essentially said that this is a very powerful weapon for the U.S. Congress, and not only can Iran be uh, persuaded to renegotiate a deal with increased sanctions, but also that European members could be coerced back to renegotiating through the use of secondary sanctions. Now, while there's no doubt that secondary sanctions have been very powerful, uh, particularly in targeting Iran's business interests with European companies, I think this statement ignores the history behind how secondary sanctions came to be imposed. And a big part of that was the cooperation of European Union member states with the U.S. administration on going along with imposing their own unilateral sanctions on Iran's financial sector and energy sector. So essentially what happened was that actions that were penalized under, under U.S. law were deemed to be similarly penalized under European Union law. And so now for members of Congress to threaten European companies and European member states with the use of secondary sanctions is not uh, being viewed very likely in the debate in Europe. Thirdly, I think the recent developments of the weekend with uh, Senator Cardin's um, opposition to the deal and also the assumption really in his Washington, uh, uh, Washington Post record that Europe will be on board and has no choice but to be on board with uh, whatever the U.S. Congress does. I think there are, um, as Colin uh, remarked before, there are certain problematic interpretations of the, this proposed bill in regard to how the final deal has been actually interpreted. And for Europeans, I think this is going to create a dilemma in terms of if this deal passes congressional review, will there be more processes in Congress to shuffle it or to undermine the parameters going forward? And really, how will this play out with the Iranian debate that's going to follow after Congress reviews it? Because the Iranians are going to see this as another backdoor way of undermining the negotiations. And I think Europeans are going to also be worried about that. Now, very quickly, three costs, and I think a no vote or a premature 
derailment of this deal by the U.S. Congress will have on U.S.-European relations. This is particularly so if Iran isn't even given a chance to start implementing, or once it starts implementing, there are new ways of sanctions that essentially, through factual means, change the deal. I think firstly, Europeans are going to be placed in a dilemma scenario. It's going to be, I've heard from officials time and time again, this is going to be a nightmare for them, to essentially decide whether to go along with a legislative organ of a foreign country and how it sees this uh, accord playing out, versus essentially the decision of 28 heads of state uh, in the European Union to unanimously endorse this deal and to put resource and energy into implementing the deal. And I think if they see this as an unreasonable obstruction of a diplomatic initiative that has taken 10 years to unfold, that the European Union has backed all the way, that the U.S. President has backed all the way, that scientists around the world have backed all the way, it's going to be very difficult for them to digest them having this uh, altered by a U.S. legislative organ. Secondly, I think it's going to have costs uh, for Western foreign policy and the unity on sanctions regimes going forward. Iran um, has been a test case, essentially, for how the European Union and the U.S. Congress works together in quite an unprecedented way to impose sanctions. And to have this snapback uh, mechanism also imposes quite unprecedented for the European Union. So if they lose, this, lose faith in this Iran test case, I think they're not going to be on board for future cases. You know, we've seen a lot of deliberation in Europe as well as in the U.S. on Russia, for example, on other countries coming under Western sanctions. And I think for Europeans, sanctions have always been seen as a foreign policy tool to achieve, achieve a means, a diplomatic end. And if they're being seen as perpetual punishment on Iran, which, as uh, Colin said, if if Cardin's bill essentially is a backdoor way of imposing nuclear-related sanctions but under a different name, then I think it's going to be very difficult to reassure European Union countries that in the future uh, for, uh, that sanctions will be used wisely. And third and finally, I think one of the things that the senators um, here in some of their discussions don't expect, and I think what they should give more consideration to, is a European pushback. Um, against um, new sanctions on Iran, new nuclear-related sanctions, or a, a bill that changes the parameters of the current deal. Because if the European Union caves on this issue, it will really set a dangerous precedent for its own foreign policy decision-making. Um, we've seen before in the 1990s when it came to Cuba or Libya or Iran with the Clinton administration's push on um, the sanctions on European companies, a real pushback by the European Union. And I think we, we may be able to see the same thing happening now. And for Europeans, really, the number one goal is to curtail Iran's nuclear uh, program so that it remains peaceful, and secondly, to prevent a military confrontation with Iran that's going to set a potentially incalculable uh, fragility in the Middle East going forward. And if they can find some sort of economic package to provide to Iran to prevent them from either going nuclear or for a military confrontation, I think they will do so and they will push back against a U.S. Congress that's trying to derail the nuclear diploma, diplomatic initiative. I think the clearest sign of that is really what's happened in the last two months with the Europeans and Iran. We've seen Federico Mogherini, the EU high rat, visiting back-to-back -back Riyadh and Iran and really outlining that her goal and their foreign policy on the Middle East is about engagement on some of the most contentious and difficult issues. And I think the mantra for her is really that you don't make peace with your friends. Secondly, we've seen Fabius, we've seen Prime Minister Hammond, we've seen the German Vice Chancellor visiting Tehran for the first time, very high level visit. And I think this was a signal really for the domestic debate here in, in Congress that Europe isn't going to wait for this domestic debate. It's going to have its own agenda on Iran and it's going to reopen embassies and it's going to talk about the regional issues and talk about trade. And so I think that's a, that, these are some of the implications to take into consideration when certain scientists think that Europeans are automatically going to follow suit whatever decision is made here in this capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very important and useful uh, reminders uh, here in Washington, uh, which we often forget about. Um, and uh, to uh, back clean up, uh, I would like to invite George Perkovich uh, to uh, offer his thoughts about uh, 
the, uh, the JCPOA, its impact, and the consequences of potential rejection down the line. So, George, thanks for being here with us. And, uh, in a sense, take up after them and say that the more I've been looking at the debate in Washington, and especially on the Hill, I, I, I conclude um, that you can't explain the vote based on an analysis of the deal um, or of its alternatives. So we're all doing our jobs. And Senator Reid, I thought, did a masterful job, made a, a very powerful case for the deal and, 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 and also suggesting the lack of alternatives. And, and I don't think when you look at the explanations of the votes in, in many cases, it just, it's not based on this kind of analysis. And I think there are a couple of ways to see that. I mean, if it were based on the deal, which Again, any deal is imperfect, so I'm not suggesting that it is perfect, but if it were based on a deal, you'd hear a lot more about some of the things that Kelsey mentioned on her list, and so I won't dilate on them, but I'll just mention some of them. The, um, the dedicated procurement channel, very important, very innovative. If you were really worried about a clandestine program and detecting that and, and strengthening the intelligence community's capacity to detect that, you would focus a, a lot more on that. Something that Kelsey did mention, the weaponization R&D band, that it's specified, that it's permanent, that it's unprecedented, that it fills a gap where the nonproliferation treaty never defined a nuclear weapon, never specified uh, kinds of R&D that were out of bounds. Uh, this agreement um, does that. It also, the discussion neglects the incentives uh, for Iran. So in other words, okay, it's, you know, inevitably Iran will cheat and everything else. Well, there's so much in this deal that on the negative side should deter them from cheating. So the different verification elements that are added, the detectability and, and all of that. But precisely because it, it got some things it wanted, it has positive reasons also uh, uh, to, um, to comply with the agreement. And, and that kind of seems to be lost in a lot of the discussion here. But so are some of the other incentives for the Iranians, I think, lost. For example, I would argue that they have an incentive to trap us into demanding uh, inspections where we're going to think or allege that there's clandestine work going on, and they're going to want us to do that because then it's going to go be shown that there was nothing going on, and they can use that to humiliate us and to make it much harder for us to ask in the future when, in fact, maybe there will be something uh, going on. But there's very little discussion of, of that kind of, of, of pitfall and, and the care that you have to take in going, uh, going forward on this. And then I think also what's missing, and this shocks me the most in a lot of ways, is that the most powerful thing I've read in this debate over the last month was by uh, Rule Mark Direct and, um, what's his name, uh, Mark Dubowitz in the Wall Street Journal in July. And Rule, who writes often for the Weekly Standard, I admire, he's a very intellectually honest guy. He's advocated military force against Iran for at least 10 years. Uh, and also advocated and said, look, this isn't like a three-week bombing campaign. I'm talking about a 10-year war. And goes into it in detail and says, this is what we should do. So they write this piece in July, and he says, for those of us who believe that only military force will ultimately solve the Iranian problem because of the nature of the regime, this deal is required. Because without a deal, without having demonstrated the United States' willingness to negotiate, to make compromises, to prove, pursue diplomacy, and then to reach an agreement. Without that, and then Iran breaking it, you can't get to military force. You can only have that option if there is a deal and then Iran breaks it, um, which seems rather obvious and, and, again, so surprising to try to figure, okay, what's the motive of the people who, who are uh, opposing this? Because if they have a different strategy, the different strategy would be much stronger if Iran broke a deal than it is without a deal, where we're the ones uh, who are blamed. So I think other things are, are going on. Um, one of the things that's going on, but it's not an exhaustive list, is, you know, there is this sense, and, and Senator Reid talked about, you know, people wanting it both ways. Well, it's, it's different, it's, and it's, it's in our body politic now in a lot of ways. There's, there's a view that you just don't negotiate. You don't make compromises. 
Um, it's unprincipled. It's a defiance of one's principles. It's immoral. It's it's bad to make compromises. So this wasn't. You, you, so you shouldn't think about a negotiation. Okay, fine. How that gets manifest, or one of the ways that gets manifest is well. We shouldn't be relieving the sanctions because the sanctions will strengthen Iran's capacity to do all of these other bad things on terrorism, so on and so forth. All right, it's a genuine concern. But then I think that view is very, I try to put it in Republican terms. I mean, we always talk about, you know, taxes, it's not, our, it's not the government's money, it's our money. Well, these sanctions weren't America's money. Um, the sanctions were either Iran's money or the other companies and countries who were doing business with Iran, which uh, then forwent that business. They agreed, in essence, to accept the tax in the form of sanctions in order to get us to negotiate with Iran a nuclear deal where Iran would meet basic terms. Right? So now our position is, okay, we're going to take the money we tax from them, we got the deal, which was the explanation for why we needed the tax. And we're saying, now we've changed our mind. We're going to use your money to pursue regime change for Iran forever and not end the tax. And it, it just the mind boggles that, that they think that somehow um, you would have had this money if you hadn't promised to give it back to the, uh, to the Iranians. But there's very little discussion on it. Similarly, on the sanction sequence, uh, well, the problem is the sanctions are come, the, being relieved immediately. They should come later. I was walking in the Adirondacks hiking a couple weeks ago. I, like, I shouldn't. I had a great vacation, but still, I think a lot about this. So, <laughs> like hiking up the mountain, I go, yeah, like, have you ever watched a gangster movie where the gangster either gives you the hostage or the weapons that they're selling you and says, don't worry, I'll take the payment in five years. Right? It's all, the whole movie is about the timing of the exact uh, coterminous nature of the transfer. And the worry that as I'm handing it to Kelsey, I'm going to get shot, or my guys are going to shoot her, and how do we, you know. It's all about simultaneous. And so I'm trying to think of the Iranians with whom we have total distrust, and they mistrust us more than we mistrust them. Like way more. If that's possible. It is possible. And so the idea that somehow, okay, we're going to deliver and you're good, you Americans are good for the congressional support of the sanctions release in five years, and I'll go back and tell the leader this was the deal I got. Um, and yet that's still part of our discourse, so it's, it's, it's shocking. So the last thought I have, and this one is hard to talk about, but I think it's super important. And Ellie alluded to it a little bit, but she's very diplomatic. Um, if somehow the U.S. reneges on this by act of Congress, ultimately a big part of that motivation is going to be the very successful and talented work of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which when you go up on the hill, people will tell you privately is kind of a driving factor. And if they derail it, they'll be public about it because they need to, they'll, they'll want to publicize that because they will have satisfied their donors, and that's their objective, and it will be a great triumph uh, there. The, the longer-term issue that we don't talk about is the effect on U.S. power, including power to defend Israel's interests, over time. If the rest of the world feels like you can't negotiate with the U.S. ultimately because you don't know what you're going to get because the government of Israel has veto power, on the United States' capacity to make policy and agreements in the Middle East. And if, and if that's the conclusion drawn, which I submit that will be the conclusion drawn if this is, uh, uh, if this is blocked, then what are the longer-term implications? Now, I, don't, I, I think the people who are uh, voting this way and taking the money, I don't think they care, but, but the republic itself has an interest. I would argue the Republican Party has a longer-term interest if they want to govern. Um, and that this is something our European allies are being polite, of, you know, and not really uh, articulating, but it will be a very active uh, uh, problem uh, that we will have to confront um, going forward. And so, uh, again, I, I think it's something we ought to talk about uh, perhaps after the vote. Thank you. Great, George. Those are all very excellent points. Um, and I must say, I, I must have had a more relaxing vacation than you because I watched the Maltese Falcon, <laughs> okay, at Humphrey Bogart and 
uh, and it did not occur to me to, to draw the analogy with the uh, <laughs> JCPOA. I, I just enjoyed the movie. Mental um, health. That's good mental health. There. <laughs> um, so we've, um, I mean, our, our three panels have put a lot of good uh, ideas and, and points uh, on the table. Um, and as we have been doing so, I would just note for those of you uh, listening carefully and not watching your Twitter feed, uh, that three uh, additional senators have publicly expressed their support for the JTCOA, Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, Senator Gary Peters of Michigan. Uh, I think there is one, uh, maybe two more senators who have not uh, expressed their view on this. So uh, how this debate plays out in the next few days, whether there is a uh, filibuster of the underlying resolution of approval or not will yet to be seen. But one of the issues uh, that, that uh, has been raised a couple times, and I wanted to start out our discussion on this, uh, is, you know, is this just the, uh, you know, the first vote, first debate on, in an ongoing uh, debate about uh, the agreement, and is, is those opponents in Congress who uh, oppose the deal, uh, are they going to continue to uh, try to find ways to undermine and uh, re-litigate, renegotiate this deal? Um, Kelsey and I had the um, pleasure of uh, seeing one of the earlier drafts of Senator Cardin's uh, legislation late last week, um, and I think it, it might be useful if she could offer some thoughts about what we see as some of the problematic elements uh, of this uh, draft legislation, which has not yet been introduced, because that just may be a, uh, a, uh, a preview of, of things to come. So if you could address some of that, Kelsey, that would be good to start us off with. Um, and then uh, we'll open up the floor to, to your questions. So the legislation that Senator Cardin is proposing is problematic for several reasons. Uh, one of the initial points that I think is worth highlighting is that it would transfer a bomb known as the Massive Ordnance Penetrator, the MOP, uh, to Israel. That's a 30,000-pound 30 30, bomb. Uh, and that bomb can only be delivered, as we know, by the B-52H bomber or the B-2 bomber. Now, Israel does not have, in its domestic capacity, the ability to deliver the massive ordnance penetrator, uh, so it would, we would also need to transfer these aircraft to Iran, and that would be a violation of the New START Treaty, given that these aircraft uh, deliver both conventional and nuclear weapons. So fulfilling this element of the legislation, uh, if it becomes law as written, would then violate our New START treaty uh, obligations uh, with, with, with Russia. So a very problematic element there. Uh, also, it is unclear if Israel has even asked uh, for this weapon. Uh, there is no sort of known Israeli request given that they do not actually have the air filter delivery capacity uh, for this weapon. Uh, there are a number of elements of the legislation that also attempt to renegotiate the provisions of the deal. Uh, while some of these are expressed only in the sense of Congress, uh, the optics that it would present are still quite problematic. Uh, one section, for instance, says that Iran will not produce highly enriched uranium uh, under the JCPOA. Now, Iran will not produce highly enriched uranium for the first 15 years of the deal, but as we have demonstrated, elements of the deal far exceed 15 years, uh, and if Iran upped its enrichment after 15 years, while that is undesirable and unnecessary, it would not be a violation of the agreement. So Iran's response to the U.S. Congress renegotiating elements, I think, would be significantly problematic in terms of implementation going forward. Uh, also problematic, the legislation requires uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency to provide the United States uh, with complete information regarding its past military dimensions investigation. Uh, as you heard Colin this morning, he talked about these being phrased as the quote-unquote sort of secret side deals with the IAEA, and he remarked that there is a need for these agreements, particularly on access to military sites, to remain confidential. Uh, the U.S. would demand this. It makes sense that Iran demand this because making this information public certainly provides a security problem. 
Uh, so requiring the IAEA to report on a safeguard's confidential uh, document uh, not only impinges upon the integrity of the agency and its processes, but also would again be unacceptable uh, to Iran based on statements that we have heard from within Iran itself. Um, you know, there are other elements that are problematic relating to, to U.S. sanctions. Uh, and when that sort of relief would come in relation to the additional protocol uh, that could actually delay Iran's permanent ratification of the additional protocol. Uh, so for a number of reasons, this legislation is problematic. And a rush to consider legislation that increases support for Israel uh, in this way uh, and seeks to renegotiate terms of the deal could actually erode implementation rather than strengthen the deal. Uh, even though there are some positive elements in Cardin's legislation, like ensuring funding for the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, so as Congress considers legislation moving forward, it will be important not to, to jump the gun and sign off on anything that actually erodes the chances of the agreement being implemented. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So we'll uh, open up the floor. Um, and it's always good at Carnegie to start with Jessica Matthews. Uh, so, uh, not anymore. I not anymore. <laughs> well, always, Jessica. So. Thanks, Sarah. I just wanted to follow up immediately on this question of, of the Cardin Bill because it, it what I mean, I think we're clear now it's not going to be a clear no on this deal, but it could be a, a muddle. And, um, uh, I look at the Cardin Bill and I think of the Mazis writing their version of the Cardin Bill, and all of a sudden we will be very quickly in who violated first. Right? So I was surprised you didn't mention the question of reimposing that the, the phrase in there that nothing in the bill prohibits sanctions on human rights, uh, terrorism, da 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 da, -da um, whereas my understanding, JCPOA says you can't take sanctions you've just listed for nuclear reasons and slap them back on. Um, so can you talk a little about that? And also, the, is the current version also says, as the earlier one did, that Iran has no right to enrich? Well, on the first point, and then I want to ask Ellie to address your, your first question. Um, yeah, the, the draft that we've seen uh, asserts that Iran does not have the right to enrich uh, uranium. Um, that's in the policy language section. Um, I think that's you know, a gratuitous statement. I mean, many of us would agree that, no, Iran doesn't really have to enrich uranium for its domestic energy needs, but uh, they have been very steadfast in preserving their right to pursue the peaceful use of nuclear energy. I mean, so this is the kind of... Uh, you know, poke in the eye from Congress that is just not going to be helpful, it doesn't serve any purpose, and it could lead to a, uh, an equal and negative reaction from the Majulis. But, Ellie, if you could, why don't you address this broader question that Jessica is raising about um, the continued uh, imposition of sanctions on human rights and terrorism and uh, further sanctions and how uh, Iran might respond to that, both in the context of the JCPOA and as well as broader relations. So I think it's a great question and comment. So see, just to highlight, the debate in Congress has already delayed the implementation process for about two months. Um, this is a time that basically after it became clear it would go into review process, it almost quick to say that our Nautilus has the right to review once Congress is reviewed. Um, so I think the Supreme Leader, for his constituency, has paid his card very smartly to say, we're not going to fully sign off on this bill until the domestic debate in the U.S. is over. My concern with Cardin's bill is that even once we pass this hurdle, hopefully this week, next week, on the congressional review process, that that's not the end of it, that we're going to get the Iranian process of review delayed because they're going to want to see what happens with these new bills and legislations or premise any um, implementation on the basis that they're not going to remove the nuclear-related sanctions label and put on human rights and terrorism um, uh, label on it. And I think one point also from the previous um, talk with Colin where uh, there was a conversation about the Europeans going ahead to do business with Iran and forgetting the human rights and terrorism uh, sanctions. Well, Europeans already have 
sanctions on terrorism human rights which will remain in place. The point is they're not going to now impose a new um, set of sanctions which can be misinterpreted as essentially the same nuclear-related sanctions. Um, and I think if that move is made, there's going to be uh, a big debate in, in Madras. And I think important to remember that this team in administration now, the Zarif Rouhani team, these are the guys that worked on essentially making a deal with the U.S. and Afghanistan in 2001, and afterwards they were burnt quite heavily within the domestic debate in Iran after the Axis of Evil campaign. And so I think this for them, if they now get burnt on this attempt to negotiate with America, I think our ability to, again, go back and renegotiate is going to be closed for quite a long period of time. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Why don't we, uh, let's see, we've got five questions. We'll try to get to everybody. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Mian, and then we'll go to Mr. Sorcioni, and then we'll go to the other side. Thanks. George, uh, my question is for you about your last point, about what this, what lessons one can learn about the practice of American leadership, or whatever word one uses to substitute for leadership, um, given the fact that in the letters that the President sent to various members of Congress and Secretary Kerry said, those letters are actually quite belligerent in tone and stress the enormous military commitment that the United States has made to Israel and will continue to make for the foreseeable future and to some of the Gulf Arab states. You know, 20% of the Israeli military budget is American foreign military financing, now the President says. And so the question is, what has that model of engagement bought in terms of actual policy outcomes for the United States in any significant way, either with Israel or with the Gulf Arab states, given the actual situations that were priorities, such as the settlements and the Palestinian issue and Syria and Iraq and so many other things. So what lessons do you think the Washington community can learn from this experience over the last few years about this? All right. And then why don't we take uh, Joe's question, and then we'll address the question. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentations by all three. And my question is related. I want to take advantage of your presence here, uh, Ellie, to have you comment on this last observation by George. How does this look to the Europeans? How does this look to the Europeans? Does it, does it seem as if Israel has a veto over U.S. national security policy? Um, my sentence is obviously a, this is just a cursory response to your very large question, but that the a big part of the impetus for this model of policy and for the financial assistance and security assistance to Israel and everything else was, um, well, it goes back before 1948 and, and after, but in general in the region, a lot of it emerged from uh, Camp David and the process there. And so there was a sense that there was uh, a peace effort. Israel had made peace, uh, at least, you know, with Egypt and Jordan and others. The U.S. needed to support that, so a lot of money to Egypt, which then we've run into what happened since 2011 in Egypt. A lot of money to Israel, obviously, uh, assistance to Jordan. And then I think some of the underwriting of the GCC states, which was originally about oil supply, so that was before the shale revolution and everything else, we wanted their oil. So that transaction, in a lot of people's minds, worked. That was keeping gas prices, uh, keeping oil uh, and gas available, but also keeping prices manageable. So that was a business proposition in a lot of ways. Um, and we haven't really changed much of it, even though the perception of the need for that oil and stuff has changed. But there was also an element of, yes, they didn't normalize relations with Israel, but they would kind of go easy on the Israelis and wouldn't, you know, cause too much trouble. Instead, they ended up focusing in Afghanistan, as you know well, and Taliban and, and the sloppy movements that don't focus so much on Israel, but on sectarian conflicts and about, on us, so what, whether that was a good deal or not. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think it's that that model has been ineffective 
and hasn't had positive outcomes from the U.S. point of view. I, but I would say that it's that it's a lot of its premises are debated or are, are, deserve to be debated now. A lot of the conditions have changed, and we haven't adapted in any way or very slightly to those changes. And so one of the ways that you see that on the Iran deal is the, you know, people on the Hill. I mean, I, I testified in February, and Senator from Nebraska, like, you know, we should give a peace treaty to Saudi Arabia, and uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, I look at it. The UAE tried to buy a port. Um, like they tried to pay for a port in the U.S., and Congress, I think 400 to, you know, 34 <laughs> voted uh, against it. Now you want to guarantee Saudi Arabia security, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, I just think we should do And I said, you know, I looked the other. I said, you got the votes for that? Um, so there, and, and so there's very little awareness of, for example, like what the Saudi regime is, who they support, you know, what sides are on on a lot of issues. But there's still a lot of people up saying that's the problem with the Iran deal is our poor Saudi friends. We have to really reassure them. And everything. So there's a lot of catching up that's going to have to be done on all of this. Um, I don't know who's going to do it because I don't see, um, I mean, you don't see in this debate people really raising that question. So I guess it's going to have to be, you know, folks like you or us or whatever. Ellie. Um, so I think the key three in particular after this deal have been very clear on outlining the, the institutional links with the Israeli um, establishment remain firm and they are in addition to the United States, very firm in their commitment to Israeli security. But I think the public discourse and also the policy discourse in Europe is very different on the position of Israel. Um, Europe has its versions of APAC, but they have nowhere near the same influential role as they do in Washington. And I think that there is now a conversation much more broadly happening across Europe about the issue of the Middle East peace process and reigniting that, and what costs are going to be imposed on Netanyahu's government for essentially ignoring every demand that the Europeans have made on this issue. And this is one of their, the, the issues that potentially Federica Mogherini is going to bring back um, to light in the Middle East, um, her Middle East program uh, and agenda. But I think also the, the appearance of Netanyahu in Congress back in March um, slightly shocked Europeans and the debate that ignited from that and the way the policy debate essentially shifted from that moment from being one focused on the nuclear issue to all of the regional problems that we have with Iran and they were very worried that that could impact the negotiations that have been so intensely focused on the nuclear issue and you know I speak to European policymakers all the time and they say well you know it was the Israeli government that told us not to link these issues mm -hmm. at the beginning and now they're insisting on us linking them again and, you know, even, even speaking to Saudis, I was in uh, Saudi Arabia last week speaking to high officials, including the foreign minister, and they said, no, actually, from our standpoint, we're firm that the regional issues have, shouldn't have been linked to the nuclear issue because we wanted to be in the room when the regional issues were debated. So I think the, there are a lot of conflicting messages from Israel for, for the Europeans, but they've managed to distance themselves in the public discourse and the policy discourse when it comes to Iran and what is the intention of the Netanyahu government in a way that is quite different to the U.S. debate. And I think that will essentially feed the conspiracy theory that APAC does have this win on this issue, um, that Washington is somehow governed and ruled by the Israeli agenda on Iran. All right. We have uh, questions over here. We're going to start in the back with Ambassador Lourdes, and then we'll come forward to the man in pink. Microphone, please. Darrell, I just would like to ask a very specific question. It's been fascinating. Thank you very much for putting it on. Um, about what this Cardin bill is supposed to do, presumably uh, in your earlier panel you discussed it, but I've talked to a lot of Democratic senators who I think are involved in a process, including Bennett and a couple of others, who want to turn this into some sort of a a partner of the actual approval bill, of the bill that will actually be uh, discussed. I don't know how that works from a legislative point of view, but my sense is that many of the Democrats who've signed on to this have signed off, have signed on to it with, quali with the qualifications that you see 
to collection the carbon bill. And I don't know how that actually will play out because we'll probably know in the next couple of days. But we're going to be spending some time on the Hill tomorrow. Did, did anybody illuminate that issue of how this carbon bill is going to relate to the actual bill that will be voted on? Well, let me try to address that and let me just remind you that, uh, I mean, we're speaking here in real time. This bill is still in draft yeah. form. Um, the Senate is about to begin debate in two hours. Uh, the supporters of the JCPOA have just reached 41. So there are a lot of things that you've just asked about that we cannot answer sitting here uh, at this very moment. Um, but let me say three things about the Cardin Bill um, that I think uh, will apply going forward. I mean, one is uh, Senator Cardin um, had a chance to look very carefully at the JCPOA. He came out with the wrong decision. All right, he's he's uh, going to vote no, even though he does not have a viable alternative. And his suggestion that there's possibility of a better deal out there is, as was said over and over again, is pure fantasy. So I think it's it's a uh, ill-conceived uh, decision on his part. And now he's offering a bill that, as Kelsey described, would reinterpret the JCPOA, mm -hmm. would uh, suggest that certain sanctions be extended for quite some time ahead, which sends the wrong signal to Iran, and that uh, certain weapons that can only be seen as uh, you know, direct military threats uh, to Iran be transferred to Israel at this point in time. I mean, this is not the time for Congress to be trying to inject these kinds of ideas into the discussion and debate about the JCPOA, as envisioned by the original corker Cardin bill. There will be time for uh, the Senate and the House to look at ways in which the United States can, should, uh, reinforce our security relationship with, with uh, Israel or the Gulf states um, at some later point in time. So, you know, for those members of Congress who are seeking to uh, attach themselves or to, to attach parts of this bill elements uh, to the resolution, I think this is just not the right time. Uh, these things have to be considered carefully, and it has to be, first of all, uh, considered um, uh, in the context of how this affects the implementation of this very important agreement. So those are all good questions, Bill, but I just, you know, I don't think we can really address I'm just saying, all of I think it's coming down to a potential that many of the Democrats who've already signed on will be signing on with Republicans. Maybe yes, maybe no. I but, think you're... But why uh, wouldn't it have to... I don't know. Isn't there a committee process, number one? Number two, wouldn't Republicans then try to amend it because it's not strong enough for them? And once they start throwing amendments on, then some of the Democrats kind of go, well, I didn't sign up for it. In other words, well, isn't it going to be the Darryl's usual right. Uh, Darrell's right. It's too difficult to speculate, but we're right. going to be meeting some staff members tomorrow, and I just don't know what the thinking is. Uh, my, my sense is that there's a lot of Republicans who would agree with the Democrats who feel that this is the way to get a win or a mini win out of this vote. Right now, Bill, there's one there's one Democrat who supports this bill. It's Ben Cardin. We don't know if there's any other support. So let me just let's leave it there. I'm sure. Okay, we could go on and on to speculate, but I was trying to say we don't really want to speculate too much. Let me just say one thing moment. about George George's remarks. Very quickly, thank you. This has nothing to do with uh, uh, the issue of the bill. I heard Cheney just before I came here. I went to the AEA in my hat of talking with the enemy. And his presentation was about a totally different bill than you're talking about. It had analysis that I've never heard before. I mean, I've heard pieces of it. But you've got to read this to know how little what we've been saying here relates to what is the word out there. So, George, would this be the first time that Vice President Cheney has been operating in his own <laughs> world? Or do you want to I – I we haven't heard – we haven't heard the good vice president, former vice president's comments, but uh, we'll look forward to that. Let me go to the next question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Muhammad Alaa from American University. Just one question to Kelsey. You suggested that Iran, over the coming 50 years, might take steps to sort of um, extend the terms of the agreement as long as other powers in the region can participate. My question is, can Israel court participate somehow? Can there be some sort of 
measures to build confidence, can we, for a change, forget about the sort of, you know, balance, traditional balance of power approach to solving nuclear uh, issues, and in the Middle East, think about nuclear free zone, with Israel signing the non-profession treaty, participating in the region, setting an example. Israel is the only country in the region with nuclear weapons. This is one thing. The other thing is, I just came from a visit to the Middle East. And I've talked to lots of people. Speaking about public opinion in the Middle East, not about leaders, public opinion. People don't care about as much about Iran, which does not have a nuclear weapon. People care more about Israel. So what leverage does the United States have? And diplomacy, and even public diplomacy, to say, let's think in terms of sort of a liberal approach to solving this issue. Thank you. Good question. Why don't you, why don't you take it? Yeah, and all the others. OK. okay. Uh, I think there are a number of steps that can be taken at a regional level to increase confidence. Uh, I don't think that Israel signing on to the NPT is going to be the first step. I think it's going to be the very last step. Uh, unfortunately, at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference this spring, the lack of consensus on a final document uh, derailed some of the very limited progress that was actually being made on establishing a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone. Uh, prior to that, the Arab League and Israel and Iran, when it was able to take time away from the nuclear negotiations, actually were sitting down at the, at, at the table together under Finnish facilitator Yakolajeva and were making some progress on coming up with an agenda to hold a conference to establish a zone. Now, that is a very long process when you consider that they're just holding meetings, not holding a conference. But it demonstrated that there were steps that both sides were willing to take to compromise on the agenda uh, for the zone, in which case, you know, Israel wants to include conventional weapons. They want a, a broader uh, mandate for the, for the zone to discuss larger regional security issues, where the Arab League has traditionally been sort of more narrow. Um, I think, so I think it, it is unfortunate that that process was derailed because Egypt took a very hard line position on where they wanted the zone discussions to go over the next year. Uh, that being said, I don't think the process should be abandoned. I think uh, in the next year, as you know, we, we look forward to the, the 2017 PREPCOM, there could be opportunities to reinvigorate parts of that process. Uh, and there are steps that the countries in the region can take independent of the process. Uh, if you look uh, in, at the Middle East, you know, Iran, Israel, and Egypt, uh, none of these countries have ratified the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And that's a step that they could all take together to provide assurance that nuclear tests uh, would be, any nuclear tests in the region would, would be detected. And also reaffirm commitments to the general principle of working towards uh, a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone. Uh, so, I mean, yes, it will be desirable at some point for Israel to sign on to the NPT, uh, but first it will be necessary to build confidence, and I think looking at some of these interim measures, uh, like restrictions on enrichment, like uh, more comprehensive monitoring and verification, will help provide some of that confidence at the regional level that will allow Israel to eventually move to a position where it would be willing to discuss giving up its nuclear weapons. Okay. We're going to take two questions here, and um, and then we're going to be wrapping up. So, um, yes, sir. Well, you mentioned that uh, Europeans will be maintaining their uh, sanctions for human rights and terrorism, which the U.S. also. To what extent, and this goes back to Menendez's uh, statement and other people's statement, the expectation that uh, European businesses will be running to Iran to do business, which I guess some trade missions have indicated. But to what extent would uh, the continuation of U.S. sanctions that are permitted under the agreement inhibit European companies from doing business in Iran even after the agreement is in, uh, goes forward? All right, good question. All right, and then... Mr. Cochran, your second swing at the ball. Um, George, uh, I'm not in favor of using force, and I'm not arguing against the deal, but I want to challenge one of your arguments, if I understood it correctly. And that's where you said you need the JCPOA in order to justify using force if they violated it. Iran violated its safeguards agreement when it illicitly fought and loaded with uranium and spun centrifuges. 
and by violating its safeguards agreement, it violated the NPT. Right. And it's violated sanction, I mean, uh, resolutions of the UN Security Council, of which it's a member of the UN. So isn't there justification enough for all of these violations that you don't need another deal to justify whatever you were going to do in the way of force? And that goes also, do you believe under the NPT that Iran has the right to enrich if its enrichment capability was developed illicitly in violation of the NPT and its safeguards agreement? All right. So, Ellie, you want to start out and then can I, can I, can I beg, can I do, I got to take my son to the airport, so can I try to answer that one? All right, you go first. Then, I apologize, right. but he's very anxious. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, he's, he's anxious, too. Um, so just quickly, Tom, I, I, I think in politics and psychology, you know, three strikes you're out. And I, I mean, we know this in child rearing and in all sorts of other ways, like, uh, and so it really matters to have a president who came in and in a very controversial part of the 2008 election said, I will do business with these people. I will try to negotiate. He was hammered for it. He did it again in 2012. So this is a guy who's really taken risks for diplomacy. But that's a very different predicate than the Shah signed the NPT, all right, before the revolution and, yes, and then the ambiguities about, uh, you know, clandestine century. This is like a negotiated deal after all these years with this president, you know, bending over backwards, being accused for it, I mean, for doing that. But if the Iranians make that agreement and then violate it, it yes, it's going to be politically a very different thing than, than what they did before. So I think the dynamic of it would be very changed, especially for whatever president comes after this president. Um, so, and I think the Iranians know that, by the way, which is a good thing. So it strengthens the deterrent against cheating. But yes, I would say it's a different predicate. Then on the, the right to emerge, I mean, where I would disagree, I mean, I don't think it's gratuitously asking for fights to say Iran doesn't have a right to emerge. I think it happens to be the case, but they also don't not have a right. It's, the MPT doesn't speak to it one way or the other. It's a political issue. Um, and I had this discussion in Iran in 2005, and the Iranian diplomats uh, basically agree. They say, yeah, it's true. But, I mean, as long as you're willing to acknowledge that we don't not have a right, yeah, fine. We you know, can say it doesn't say we have a right. But that's the issue. So then the question of, okay, they acquired it by cheating. The response is, well, they would have gotten it one way or the other, and then they can say, well, no, no, we knew how to do it over here, and yes, we got you know, this centrifuge, but we could have gotten that centrifuge. So you really, I mean, it seems to me that's a capillary issue rather than a big issue of um, how they acquired the capacity to to enrich. It doesn't, I don't think that one gets you very far. All right. So, thank sorry, you. Sorry, you guys. Sorry. All right. Uh, we thank you. Thank you. Be careful driving. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> Ellie. Can I just tag on a few comments to what you just said? I think one thing from um, Colin's remark that was interesting to hear a U.S. administration official say is this importance of self-reliance for the Iranians. Um, and the history of mistrust definitely goes both ways. And I think for them, in terms of the nuclear capacity issue from, the, from a peaceful uh, program angle is one thing that probably they've been inspiring to get to since the Shah's time. It's been their way of balancing themselves with Israel. And I think that had they not stand up by cheating, they were completely right, they would have gotten some other way. Um, and secondly, this, this issue of America using military force, I think one thing that this administration has done is really revamp the image of the U.S. police copying the Middle East image after Iraq, which had, I think, quite dramatic uh, impact on particularly in Europe, how they viewed the U.S. policy on the Middle East. And so I think going to extreme lengths to exhaust the diplomatic angle will also bring with it, if there is cheating from the Iranian side, European support for any um, action, military action in, uh, in Iran to go to that length. Um, on the question about business uh, from the European angle, um, 
Since the interim deal, there's been trade delegations going into Iran. There's been attacks on these trade delegations for potentially breaching sanctions, and we know for a fact that that hasn't really been the case. In fact, European business with Iran hasn't really increased, uh, uh, even in the, in the allowed permitted areas under the interim deal, because most European companies are still hands off. The, the impact that the U.S. Treasury has had on European businesses has been quite um, blunt and quite um, uh, huge in terms of scaring the living lights out of them in, in business, particularly with big uh, financial sectors and the energy sector. And really, those are the two sectors that Iran is hoping to uh, reintegrate into the European business, uh, financial sector, and the energy sector. And my position has been talking with um, CEOs of major oil companies in Europe is they're going to tread with a lot of caution going back into Iran. They, they took a big financial hit having to pull their resources and their um, projects out of Iran, and they're going to want to see at least a year or two of successful implementation of this deal before they march back in. And, you know, there's already been worries that at a state level in the U.S., sanctions are going to be imposed in various forms on this nuclear issue. And I think they're going to watch very carefully how this plays out in the U.S., both at a state level and also in terms of the next U.S. president um, implementing this, this deal. So I don't think we're going to see a, a, a flood of um, energy investment um, that Iran needs in the next year or two. I don't think it's a Burma case at all. The level of sanctions on Iran have really been unprecedented, so I think it's going to be a slower process than what people claim. All right. Well, thank you very much. We are we are out of time for uh, this morning's uh, uh, event. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. I and mean, I think uh, with presentations from Kelsey, Ellie, and George, I and mean, I think uh, We've tried to underscore why this is a, a game changer for nuclear nonproliferation, why it's in the U.S. Uh, necessary interest and that of our allies, and um, why uh, we have 41 senators right now expressing their strong support for this, despite the uh, very partisan nature of, of the debates. And uh, so we thank you for being here and look forward to engaging in the future on uh, how this deal plays out and the other problems that we, we all are concerned about. So please join me in thanking the speakers.